I usually have stage fright, so I took a couple of quaaludes before I came up here to <laughs> kind of settle down a little bit. I thought that would be good. Anyway, uh, today I'm talking on uh, opioids and uh, American medicine and a little bit about uh, orthopedics along the way. Um, this is a big topic, so I took the liberty of actually, it's going to take me just a little bit more uh, time to go through this than your 15 minute talks today. But I have a talk at the end, and if everybody, I'm the very last speaker, so if everybody wants to bag that talk and go drink beer, uh, we can do that, but I'll leave that up to you at the end, all right? So, uh, I'm not a pain doctor, and I do not want your chronic pain patients. <laughs> I have nothing to disclose, although I do wish someone would pay me for this talk. <laughs> do I have to hit this again? Yep. Who is to blame for this nation's opioid crisis? If anyone is qualified to point an accusing finger, it may be the man who led the fight against another scourge years ago. Our cover story is reported by Lee Cowan. The makers of opioids. Tobacco, if somebody smokes a cigarette, it might be 30 years, 40 years before the disease process works and kills them. You take too many opioids, they'll kill you today. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, opioids killed more than 42,000 people in 2016. The White House Council of Economic Advisors estimates just in 2015, the cost associated with the opioid crisis topped $500 billion. Opioid market. So Moore, now in private practice, is taking his skills on the road again, encouraging cities, counties, even entire states to come together and sue the drug makers, the same way states coalesced to sue Big Tobacco. Tobacco told us that nicotine was not an addictive drug. They told us that smoking did not cause cancer. These companies told us that there was less than 1% chance of getting addicted to these opioids and that they're absolutely proven to be effective for chronic pain. Both of those turn out to be really big lies. The nation's drug makers vigorously deny these allegations but agree there is an opiate addiction problem. However, they suggest blaming them for the entire crisis is, in the words of one drug maker, a stunning oversimplification. They dismiss any comparison to tobacco, pointing out that their opioid products are approved by the FDA, and say many of those who are dying of overdoses are abusing street opioids, not legal prescriptions. There's plenty of fault. The federal government's at fault. For God's sake, the FDA should have never approved some of these drugs. The states are at fault. The companies are at fault. Individuals are at fault. Doctors are at fault. There's plenty of fault. We can point our fingers all day long, but with all those <laughs> places to point the finger, why just go after the drug companies? Well, you can't sue the federal government. You know, you can't sue all the individuals for taking the drugs. Trying to sue all the doctors in the country wouldn't work very well. So, what I say is, if there's a hundred percent fault out there amongst many, many players, at least go to the people who made the billions of dollars on this. What we see by filing these suits is accountability and restitution. So what started as a trickle has turned into a flood of litigation and significantly harmed South Carolina and its citizens. There are now hundreds of city and county lawsuits being filed, as well as cases brought by at least 15 states so far. We believe that 80% of the people who are addicts today, 80% of the people we've lost in Ohio, uh, started with pain meds. You think it's their fault? I, I think, no one else's. Look, I, I think a great deal of the fault lies at the feet of the drug companies, and you have to go back to these drug companies because they're the ones who misled the physicians. We firmly believe that we're going to win, and we believe that the amount of money that the jury will come back is going to be very, very high. It may come down to a public relations battle. Drug makers don't want to be tied to images of overflowing morgues. But that's just what's been happening in places like Dayton, Ohio, where the county coroner, Kent Harshbarger, had to build another freezer just to accommodate all the bodies of opiate overdose victims being sent his way. Have you ever seen anything like this? Nobody's seen anything like this. The opioid crisis is a whole new death investigation problem. What's different, he says, beyond the size of the epidemic, is its victims. Many are from upper middle class families with no history of drug abuse. People like 27-year-old Sean Herman, who got hooked on OxyContin in college. 
And I don't think the majority of people who become addicted, say to heroin, go out and say, you know what, today I'm gonna try heroin. Let's see what that's like. The majority start with pills. His mom, Sharon Parsons, didn't know it at the time, but as the pills became harder and harder to get, Sean turned to street opioids, like heroin. He ended up overdosing on fentanyl, the same drug that killed Prince and Tom Petty. So, <clears throat> there it is in the lay press. Um, we have a big problem in this country. 138 people every day die from opioids, overdoses. Three-fourths of those were started on physician-prescribed medications. We need to take some responsibility for this problem. We're 10% of the world's population, and yet we consume 90% of the narcotics made in the world. Um, August 3rd, 1999 was not a good day. That's when the JCHO introduced the standards for assessments and the management of pain. All of a sudden, pain became the fifth vital sign. So now your nurse has to go in your hospital room and ask you every 20 minutes, every half hour, what's your pain? Instead of getting your mind off of pain, they're taught to go in and remind you that you're supposed to be having pain, and then you're supposed to come up with some arbitrary number on a 1 to 10 or give them a smiley or a frowny face and tell them where your pain is when you should be talking about something that totally gets their mind off of that subject, correct? And then Margot McCaffrey was an RN, uh, oops, excuse me, who uh, developed the Patient's Bill of Rights, and in that Bill of Rights it says, Pain is whatever the experiencing person says it is, existing whenever and wherever that person says it does. Is that right? Hmm. Cultural change. Here we go. Look at these Conestoga wagon folks. They're going out across the Oregon Trail. You think that guy had back pain every day? I bet he probably did. You think he was looking for somebody to give him some pain pills every time he went around some corner? Or ran into some Native Americans and said, hey, you know, um, and it's crazy what we've done to ourselves. American doctors are known amongst the world doctors as pill pushers. Now give me a, I'll give you an example of that, not just in narcotics, but if you go up to somebody and they're overweight, they've got high blood pressure, they never exercise, hmm? What happens? The doctor gives you a high blood pressure pill. What should the doctor give you? He should give you a program for exercise, weight loss, avoiding salt, changing your diet. But what happens in this country? We get a pill for high blood pressure. So there's also a myth about narcotics. It's the strongest of the pain medicines. We need to talk about that later. And then it's easier to give a pill than it is to have that arduous conversation with a drug seeker about avoiding narcotics and the dangers of narcotic addiction. I'll tell you in my own practice, it wears me down. I know when that narcotic seeker comes into my office, it's not going to be an easy visit, and it's not going to be a quick one. And I will admit, in my own practice, I've written prescriptions over the years just to get them out of my office because I just can't do it again. That's bad medicine, though. That's not what I'm advocating here, but it is reality. So is there really a problem? This right here shows you what the problem is. Part of the problem, anyway. Of all the narcotics that are taken out there, the ones that are most uh, sought after are the ones that are actually prescribed by physicians. The first two bars here show you the medications that are actually obtained from, from physicians, okay? So the more likely and the more frequent a person was to use non-medical opioids, not for pain, but to get high uh, and for other reasons, the more likely they were to have actually come from a doctor than a drug dealer. That's alarming to me. Here's oxycodone, okay? Oxycodone has been around for many, many years, okay? It's not a new drug. Oxycontin was uh, actually approved in 1995. Oxycontin is the sustained release form of oxycodone, okay? so. Here we have the prescriptions for oxycodone consumption from 1980 to guess when? 1995, when OxyContin was approved, okay? What happened then? All of a sudden, 
there's people out marketing the drug like crazy. The, the need for this drug didn't all of a sudden increase all of a sudden. The, the marketeers got out there with a patent on it by a specific company, and look what happened. That same thing did not happen in Europe. Here's some demographic issues. Um, the opioid uh, problem, unlike other drugs like crack cocaine and other things, the opioid problem does affect um, all comers. It doesn't matter about race, race, ethnicity, or your age. It is affecting all comers, and here's a graph to prove it. Here's a regional problem. The dark colors here, the dark blue, indicates uh, the highest uh, death rate per 100,000 is in these dark areas, okay? We're in a green area, which is one of the better areas. The dark areas indicate where the problem is the most. And guess where they make the producer of OxyContin is? It's in New Jersey. So, is there really a problem? Drug companies don't want you to know that the increasing number of narcotic-related deaths directly parallels the increasing sales of prescriptive narcotics. Okay? Prescriptive narcotics in the dotted line, opioid overall death rate in the red line, and the number of admissions for opioid overdoses is in the blue line. They parallel each other. So the opioid crisis is national and regional. The CDC and a joint commission with a congressional panel uh, looked at Kermit, West Virginia. In 2016, there's a little Rite Aid drugstore in Kermit that sold 9 million narcotic pills, okay? Kermit has 400 people. <laughs> 42,000 people died of narcotic overdose in 15 and 16. More Americans died from opioids than car crashes. 2016, the per capita rate of opioid prescriptions was four times as much as the rest of the states in Kentucky, Ohio, West Virginia, the average of all other states. Okay? Municipalities uh, have had to increase their more budgets, as you saw in that video I showed you. So I put this up again. This is the area that currently has the highest problem. But if you look at the highest growth rate of the problem, it actually is in the central to north central Midwest, believe it or not. So it's coming our direction. More statistical facts. Heroin, heroin itself was legal until the 20s. Uh, deaths were actually relatively rare. Four out of five heroin addicts started as prescription narcotic users. So again, we want to always blame the drug dealers. Well, the drug dealers in this case might be the physicians. The majority, three-fourths of deaths are from opioids are from legal prescriptions. One out of 20 adults are opioid users. Of those, Three-fourths of them don't work. 40% are on full disability for questionable reasons. 34% are admit, uh, admit to using pills to get high, so they're not using it for pain. Painkiller-related deaths quadrupled since 1999. Have I convinced you yet that there's a problem? <laughs> All right, so who's to blame? Well, I'm a doctor. I take responsibility for part of this. Pharmaceutical industry, for sure. I'll go into that in a minute. Pain clinics. For a long time, these pain clinics made a living on doling out narcotics. We know who they are in this town. Everybody knows in their towns who's the doctors that give out the most liberal prescriptions and who's the ones that are going to keep them going. JCOH, for reasons I showed you earlier in their treatment of pain, is the fifth vital sign. Nursing organizations and the patient's bill of rights. Insurance carriers are also to blame. Let's take an example. Let's say you have some low back pain. Who doesn't get that once in a while, right? So what's the kind of the standard care? Well, it used to be do some stretching, try some physical therapy, you know, heat packs on your back, blah, 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 whatever we used to do that actually worked because most of the time it's better within a week anyway, no matter what you do. But they don't let you do any of that anymore. The drug companies, I mean, excuse me, the insurance carriers won't pay for a lot of that stuff anymore because it's cheaper to just write a prescription for Flexeril and then narcotic and tell them to wait a little bit and uh, they'll get better. But that doesn't prevent it in the future because the stuff, 
all you smart physical therapists do, teach them core strengthening and all the other things to keep them from having it again, right? But no. So we get into this uh, kind of a deal. So there's a lot of people to blame for this. Let's blame this guy, <laughs> Herschel Jick. Jick wrote a letter to the editor. This is not a scientific study. This is a letter to the editor in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1980. Um, and in that letter, he basically uh, indicated that they didn't feel that narcotics were very addictive. He says, we conclude that despite the widespread use of narcotic drugs in hospitals, the development of addiction is rare in medical patients with no history of addiction. Okay? This letter not scientific study, this letter has been used by hundreds of drug companies in their literature as a reference to their product not being all that addictive. Okay? So we have these two folks, Foley and Portnoy, who said in their article on chronic uh, use of opioids, if you have pain, you can't get addicted to opiates, according to them, because the pain soaks up the euphoria. People really bought into that. This was a, a taught at, at, at medical schools for a while. So this poor annoy was in 1993 at Memorial Sloan Kettering, Kettering Hospital as a pain specialist. He said opioids can't be, can be used for a long time with few side effects. Opioids are a gift from nature. Opioids need to be destigmatized. He took jabs at other doctors by saying that they were opioidophobics. And he suggested that, uh, Concerns about addiction and abuse amounted to a medical myth. He was a paid consultant for Purdue Pharma, who makes MS Cotton and OxyContin, and his research was funded by Purdue Pharma, and he was a paid speaker for Purdue Pharma. This gentleman, Arthur Sackler, uh, is a very interesting fellow with his uh, two brothers. He originally trained as a psychiatrist, and his brothers are also doctors. Eventually, he left medicine to actually work for and later bought a PR firm, and it actually revolutionized, back in the 70s, the doctor-physician uh, uh, drug rep relationship. Drug reps now walk into our offices and they expect to get your ear and talk to you and take you out to lunch and all this. That never happened before this. This is the guy that kind of started that. His major client at the time um, was Purdue Frederick, which later became Purdue Pharma. And he actually, and his two brothers bought the company later, okay? He retained the rights to an extended release uh, drug called Continus. So if you've heard of MS Contin, that is a sustained released uh, morphine. MS stands for morphine sulfate. And OxyContin is the oxycodone sustained release. So he got the a patent for those. It's all different today. I hear every mother say, Mother needs something today to fall down. And though she's not really ill, there's a little yellow pill. She goes running for the shelter of her mother's little helper, and it helps her on her way. Gets her through the busy day. And it goes on and says, Doctor, please, Laura, please. I always wanted to be a rock and roller. <laughs> oh well, another life. So, who marketed value? Where did this all get started? Okay, well this Purdue, well, excuse me, not Purdue Pharma, but the Sackler brothers who owned that PR company um, learned uh, about the first boutique medication, I think. I think we can call it value in that. Um, not only did they market these drugs, to the mothers with kids who were running around taking their little yellow pills, but they marketed it to the kids themselves. They actually suggested that parents help with their kids' anxiety going off to college by sending them off with some Valium. And they did. Here's the advertising at the time. Valium. Sweet, refreshing Valium. <laughs> Gotta love it. So, is the first one to reach a billion dollars, the first drug of everything. You know, aspirin never reached a billion dollars, but 1975, uh, Valium did, directly marketed to doctors, the Sackler Brothers, who also owned, believe it or not, a medical publishing company. It was supposedly peer-reviewed, but guess what? Amazingly, all the articles about Valium in their 
publications were always favorable. Hmm, was there a conflict of interest here? Maybe. Maybe. So these Sackler brothers were geniuses. They were like Ford Motor Company. Ford Motor Company got the ore out of the ground, they made the steel, they shaped the steel, and put a car together. Well, these guys did the same thing. They owned Purdue Pharma, makers of OxyContin and MSContin. They owned the advertising agency for that, targeting doctors. IMS is a company that actually tracks every prescription ever written by any provider. So if you've writ for, written for 10 prescriptions of 20 OxyContin, this company knows it. And they knew it way back even before the computer technology in the 80s, or early, late 70s and early 80s. They owned the Medical Tribune, which went to 650,000 doctors bi-weekly. They paid for doctors to speak at medical conventions in favor of their drugs. They were found guilty of paying the head of the FDA at the time, Henry Wetch, $300,000 to promote their drugs through the system. Okay? And they sat on boards of hospitals that were conducting the same clinical trials to get their FDA uh, approval. Think about that. They were involved in every step of the way, influencing how people would approve their drug. Very interesting. So Purdue Pharma practices, um, they instructed their sales reps to assure doctors without any evidence and repeatedly that fewer than 1% of patients taking OxyContin will become addicted. A 1999 Purdue study showed that OxyContin taken sporadically, not even consistently, taken sporadically for headaches resulted in a 13% addiction rate. Sales reps weren't told that, though. They call them whales in, uh, in Vegas, the guys that are high rollers. Well, that's what the internal documents at Purdue Pharma called the doctors that would write all these prescriptions. They call them whales. And those whales got paid for trips to Boca Raton and cruises and all kinds of fun things back in the day. When addiction and death rates related to opioids became apparent in the 2000s, Sales reps were actually told to sell through the adversity. Tell doctors that the extended release delivery of these, of these drugs reduces the abuse liability of the drug, when in fact the opposite is true. They're mu receptors. They actually are worse when they're extended periods of exposure to these drugs. So it's, it's the worst thing you can do. So the reps were also taught uh, an advertisement stated, OxyContin is a drug to start with and stay with. So you come in with a normal ankle sprain and just give them OxyContin. And don't think about Motrin or Advil or anything, just give them OxyContin, why not? Selling drugs requires the seduction of not just the patient, but the doctor that writes the prescription. Owner of the company, Arthur Sackler. Curtis Wright, MD, was a top scientist at the FDA, influenced in getting OxyContin approved in 95. As soon as it got approved in 1995, he quit, was given a job by Purdue Pharma in the high six-figure range. That's according to David Kessler, former head of the FDA. 2001, Purdue Pharma paid its sales associates over $40 million in bonuses and actually was their number one seller. And if you take that and divide it by the number of sales associates, that's about $80,000 a year per uh, salesperson in a uh, 2001, so what's that, $100,000 today maybe, I don't know. Other contributing factors, Janssen Pharma, so Purdue Pharma wasn't the only one, they make fentanyl, they're promoting the fentanyl patches for the steady predictable stream of narcotic, eliminating breakthrough pain, which is one of the worst case scenarios for addiction. Kaiser Permanente uh, paid their physicians in part uh, for patient satisfaction rates. So. When your drug seeker went into your doctor and you were a Kaiser Permanente doctor, if you wanted to get a good rating from that patient, what do you do? You write them the prescription they're seeking, right? You don't try and talk them out of it. You just, oh, you guys want another refill on your oxy? Here you go. The number of narcotics prescriptions doubled. Well, they changed their ways and they don't do that anymore. Um, JBJS, just recently. Perioperative use of opioids pretends worse outcomes following an array of surgical procedures. So don't take the attitude, oh, I'm going to send you to the orthopedist here in a month or so. Um, let me just give you some of these, you know, Narcos, Oxycontin, whatever, to get you by until you get there. That's probably the wrong thing to do because it makes it a lot harder to take care of them if we do have to operate. The doctor's current dilemma is a higher number of uh, opioids prescribed may promote 
greater patient satisfaction while simultaneously <coughs> healing the problems of excess opioid and addiction. So here we are. Here's a, um, the idea of being compassionate, but we also have to show uh, prudence. So, you know, prima non nostra is the uh, motto of medicine, first do no harm, but um, also in the Hippocratic Oath it says, neither will I administer a poison to anyone, to anybody when asked to do so, nor will I suggest a course. And I don't know that we've always followed that, have we? So, let's go through this, a real uh, scenario here. He's a 28-year-old man who has uh, had a shotgun blast to his arm. Broke his humerus in multiple pieces, as you see. Now, if that came into me, I'd say, hey, Dr. Nori, what are you doing this afternoon? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so he was debrided and fixed as he should have been. Not a bad job, given what he had, right? Uh, so everything was put together on post-up day number one. Post-up day, or uh, six months after, not, oops, excuse me, not much is happening here. It's not healing, is it? Well, they waited a little bit longer and went by the 13 months. Finally, the hardware gave way. So they had to operate on it again, put another plate on, and guess what? That next plate broke at 18 months. So they got a really smart thing. Okay, I'll get you. I'll put two plates on. <laughs> so they put two plates on, and at 21 months, um, it's not healed. But finally, at 34 months, it heals. But let's look at this. Here he is at 26 months. So remember, 18 months was the two plating, right? So here we have a hypertrophic non-union. It's not united, even many months after this double plating. So what actually happened to make this heal? Okay? Well, it turns out that over that period of time, from 13 to uh, 26, the guy had 800 Percocet, 150 Tramadol, 150 MS Cotton, 75 Oxycontin. Okay? All right, so let's talk about this. The metabolic and endocrine abnormalities in patients with non-unions. Narcotics make you hypogonadal, meaning your testosterone, even women have testosterone, right? It goes down, and it goes down by a lot. And there's studies to prove that. And you need testosterone to some degree to heal broken bones. Well, hypogonadism caused by the opioids actually causes that. So the supposition here is the only thing that changed between that non-union and when he actually healed was the fact he was taken off all of both, all the opioids. So he actually went on to heal because he started making testosterone again. Okay? So there's a lot of evidence for this now. And this is different than what I was taught when I was in uh, residency. I was taught, oh, don't go, you know, don't put them on all these anti-inflammatories because that delays bone healing. Well, it turns out that that's probably not true. And number two, the opioids we gave them in place of that probably do delay bone healing. So things have changed. So here's the evidence of non steroidals They're actually safe to give. They don't cause non-unions. We can go into that more. Um, spine surgeons still avoid them because they're afraid that they don't allow bone to heal. But I think that's debatable anymore. So how should pain be approached going forward? We need to dispel the myths. Narcotics aren't always the best painkillers. Educate the public about the dangers of opioids, and then stand firm on reasonable prescriptive practices. Uniformity in how pain is addressed. Well, somebody shouldn't be able to doctor shop and know they're going to go get 100 Oxycontin if they go to this guy, and they're only going to get you know, none if they go to this guy, whatever. We should get some uniformity. And I don't know how to do that other than government's going to probably tell us how to do that, I would guess. Um, not always the best answer to problems, but unless we do something, that will be what happens. Um, multimodal pain approach and treatments not involving any medications. We should not forget that there are a lot of things besides drugs we can do to help people with pain. So, uh, we got to get rid of these bits. Narcotics are a uh, more powerful pain uh, form of painkiller. We all believe that, but that's certainly not true chronically. Uh, Long-acting opioids are less addictive. Not true. Long-acting narcotics have less abuse potential. Not true. If you take an opioid pain medication for a valid reason, you can't get addicted. Not true. Everyone standing if they have uh, pain has a right to an opioid pain medicine. Well, I'm not sure that's true either. So here's another evidence that uh, non steroidals are actually pretty good pain relievers for those of you who don't believe me. Here's a study that was done, ibuprofen and acetaminophen, that all these other, beat all these other narcotics 
by a lot. Okay? Um, modern pain management is multimodal. So when we do a, a surgery anymore, we're hardly ever doing just one thing to relieve pain. We do non-medication methods. But we don't talk about pain a lot. When I make rounds in the morning, I don't go in and just ask the patient, well, how much pain you're having and all that. We want to distract them off of that. We want to, ice actually works a lot. And depending on the situation, immobilization or mobilization can actually help. We used to use CPMs, and we don't for many reasons anymore, continuous passive motion machines for knee replacements. But the one thing the CPMs did do is help relieve pain. Okay, they probably didn't improve motion. In fact, there's some studies that suggest they didn't improve extension. They probably limited it. But CPMs after a knee replacement were actually pretty uh, beneficial for pain relief. Um, there's a lot of things with uh, Tylenol now. We think it works in an adjunct factor to a, a lot of the other things that are out there, non steroidals we all know about those. The anticonvulsants are actually being used as pain medicines these days with gabapentin and others. Nerve blocks and local anesthetics, we use those frequently. Ketamine is probably going to be used a lot more in the future. It used to be just an anesthetic, but now it's actually being used as a painkiller. And then the opioids, of course, they will never go away completely. So what's the CDC say on opioid use? You should not use prescriptive narcotics for chronic musculoskeletal pain, including fibromyalgia. I can't tell you how many people I see in my office chronically being treated with narcotics for fibromyalgia. Well, it's not just me saying it. The CDC says that's probably not a good idea. Except that mild to moderate pain is better than addiction. Educate that opioids are not the best painkillers. Other far safer alternatives exist, and the public needs to come to believe that. Because right now, they don't. If you tell them, you know what, we have this other alternative that's actually better, if their mind is set on getting OxyContin, there's nothing you can say that's going to change their mind. Doesn't mean we shouldn't try, but that's been my experience. Educate that opioids are not the best painkillers. Set a time frame for uh, prescription of a narcotic pain medication. For the CDC recommends only 10 days to two weeks for an acute event, like a fracture or a major joint surgery. They don't think you should be taking this for months at a time. Never give extended release drugs for an acute problem, okay? And identify addictive personalities early and have a clear understanding of expectations before initiating treatment, okay? Now everyone here should know I'm talking about what I do, which is orthopedics. I'm not talking about a patient who is dying of pancreatic cancer. That's a different story completely, okay? We're talking about these acute pain uh, syndromes um, and that type of thing. So the Sackler brothers, we gotta hammer on them one more time before we go. <laughs> So they've got all these great philanthropic things they've done. All these great big marble uh, uh, things they've done with the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Gallery in Washington, the Museum at Harvard, Center for Arts and Education, Sackler Wing at the Louvre, um, Oxford University, they have another big marble um, uh, building. But is that really philanthropy? Because the Sacklers built a lasting uh, thing to monuments themselves off the proceeds made through unethical business practices and off several million addicted Americans. Not a dime has been given to the treatment of addiction or creating addiction centers. All right, so there we go. A patient is entitled to reasonable attempts to relieve pain by reasonable measures. You are not entitled to pain relief any more than you're entitled to happiness. This is pure happiness. <laughs> That's my granddaughter. She got a new little Barbie thing, see? <laughs> you can't beat that for a six-year-old. That's happiness. From the house of God, uh, the delivery of good medical care is as much to do nothing as possible. My take on that would be much of the opioid crisis is a result of trying to do too much to match unreasonable expectations. Okay? We're going to have a little pain in life. Everybody has a little back pain most of the time, at least I do. Life goes on, right? Not that I'm tougher than anybody else, but you all do. You don't need pills for everything we do in life. That's all I have to say. Dr. Bob? Uh-oh. <laughs> Bonnie's got a question. <laughs> And when Bonnie has a question, I'm usually in trouble. <laughs> My question is, 
is you go in, you give them a prescription, and they just have a fit because it isn't what they want. I mean, they'll scream and holler at you if it isn't the patient, it's the family. And then you have to take that verbal abuse. I mean, where does that end? Uh, I, I mean, I agree with you. Um, where's my <laughs> nurses? I know they're here somewhere, but. Um, <laughs> Uh, it wasn't more than a couple months ago, I had to do a below the knee amputation on this young man and bad diabetic problem. And uh, the same thing happened. He was literally swearing up and down, spit was coming out of his mouth, um, how insensitive I was, and it just went on and on and on. And, um, you know, you're close to calling 911 because you're worried about the threats and all. I, I, I don't have a good answer to that. I don't. I just think we all have to have the same kind of approach, though. Because if, you know, some doctors are dealing this out, I mean, I mean honest to goodness, there's, there's people who have made their whole career in medicine doling out this pain medicine. And when the community knows that, and they're like, okay, I'm just going to go to him then. You know? Or her, I should say. Well, I don't want to do this. We have to get risk management in there, yeah. everything. It's a huge problem. And you have to feel that because you're getting the axe for nothing. I mean, you're doing your job. I'm trying to condone that behavior. And I know you don't have an answer. It's just, it's really difficult to wear on people. It's very frustrating. Thank you. I'm sorry, Kevin. I apologize for going over my time.